You've scanned the headlines, read the articles, and liked the posts. Now listen to the experts themselves in the Future of Work podcast, presented by allwork.space. Are you ready? Hello, and welcome to the Future of Work podcast by allwork.space. I'm Joe Mernier, and today I'm looking forward to talking to David Schwarz from Hush. David is an award-winning creative leader who spent nearly the past 20 years designing brand experiences that integrate content, interactivity, architecture, and technology. Internally, David focuses on making space for creativity, which of course will resonate deeply with anyone connected to co-working. In David's words, creating space for creativity means cultivating studio environments that foster collaboration and trust, that promote democratic contribution, and generate an open source repository of cultural, stylistic, and technological knowledge to inspire teams. So enough from me. Hello, David, and thank you for joining us on the Future of Work podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. Really pleased to have you. I'm I'm really looking forward to this conversation, I have to say. So um, I'm going to jump straight in and say, first of all, can you give us a a quick whirlwind tour of what you've been doing for the past couple of decades and and how you came to create your brand, Hush? Sure. Um, Oh, so I was actually not trained as a designer. I went to an undergrad liberal arts college, but I'd always been interested in in design and art and architecture and and sort of active in the arts in that way. But I think maybe didn't have the confidence to commit to um, this sort of pursuit. Um, it, it only really went. Uh, I kind of jumped into the dot com design boom in 1999 in San Francisco, where there was a lot of craziness going on. And, you know, there were parties for these small companies called Google and things that you didn't even know what they did. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, we were I was I was enthralled by the the way design and interface and technology and storytelling kind of all came together in this rapid fire way uh, in this new medium. Um, I went to graduate school at Art Center College of Design in, in Los Angeles, which sort of uh, was a really transformative time um, for me. I worked harder than you know ever and just like lived every bit of information I could get my hands on. Mm-hmm. Um, studied film, studied digital, studied architecture, studied branding and design and animation, and just it was just a massive. Uh, sp- I was a massive sponge. Um, and it felt really, really, really powerful. So that, uh, basically, after that, I, I sort of um, I had a lot of freelance jobs where I kind of came in as a designer and architect, uh, sorry, art director um, for digital agencies uh, at the time. And I did some work in commercial direction for television. And, and, and it was a pretty, like, varied experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and I... I quickly was put in positions like far beyond what I actually knew how to do. Um, that was maybe just because I really loved taking on challenges and maybe I had the guise of someone who could do it well, uh, even if I didn't have the, the, the hours behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, so people took risks on me and I, I kind of just jumped in and did it and I was somewhat successful. So um, in, in retrospect, we started the company in 2006. We started Hush as a sort of amalgamation of a lot of these experiences we picked up along the way. I had sort of a, you know, a, a, a more visual design, spatial design background. My partner had more of a technical um, uh, background and sort of, it was like a CCO, CTO kind of marriage. Mm-hmm. And um, we sort of built the, the studio in a, in a way that reflected a lot of our backgrounds where we had this sort of, um, you know, quite varied um, experience through creative and um, and thinking about the way people interact with ideas and stories and spaces and content. And um, it was kind of new at the time, frankly. It wasn't really uh, industry per mm-hmm. se, like experience design, you know, as, as what we call that now kind of was happening. You know, it was part of what architects always thought about, part of what digital companies always thought about, um, but but maybe not with the parlance that we, we use today. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's short for saying we kind of knew what we wanted to do, but it was more setting sail in a direction, not having it perfectly scripted. Yeah. Um, and yeah. It, experience design. Can you explain what that means in a nutshell, if that's possible? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, 
so first let me say it's the worst nomenclature in the world okay <laughs> it's terrible it, it's uh i think what it is in truth with a capital e is really thinking about how people human beings um uh uh, understand a story or an idea or meaning of an organization um, through all the the design lenses possible, right? How does space and light and sound and material and um, interface and image, you know, create this 360 degree understanding of an idea? And that idea could be what a company or a brand stands for, for its customer, for its employee in the workplace, or it could be um, what a cultural institution hopes to do for in the world, um, but but in any sense, it's it's really looking at design through all these lenses and knowing that they're greater than the sum of their parts. And so, if you understand really how to manipulate each of those things in the right way, you can really position um, that story mm. in the real world in its optimal space. Of course, underneath it. It has categories of things like service design. You know, if you're in a consumer facing process, it has an operational piece, a process piece, a program piece, a journey piece. Um, and then uh, it also, we believe, has a sort of like beauty and artistic and aesthetic piece. Like everything we do is meant to be perceived through the senses in a, in a, in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is that word experience is uh, it's, it's like mud or clay. It's just pulled in every direction by anyone who needs it. So there's lots of people who use the words experience design, you know, to talk purely about digital applications, right? The experience within the rectangle or the interface. And that's fair. It's just not the same definition we have. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a good catch all, but it's a real once you're in the business and it's like peers trying to work out exactly what you do and what you don't do and what our approach is, it's, it kind of gets tough because it's it's um, it's it's not as nuanced as it needs to be. Yeah. And I want to ask you how you apply experience design to the workplace, but I'm also interested in your workplace journey um, as you've uh, created Hush and I've used uh, as you've been through that journey of uh, building a business and bringing on people. Um, so what was it like? Where did you work when you first started your business and how, uh, what does your workplace look like now? That's a great question. So in a professional career history, like beat by beat. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, it's pretty simple actually. So um, when I left uh, graduate, well, sorry, when I was in San Francisco before I went to graduate school, I worked for a small studio that was eventually acquired by one of the management consulting firms. So it was a digital agency called Total Creative. It was mm -hmm. about 20 people to start, maybe 80 when we left. So I saw some growth there over a couple of years. Um, I was just, I was green, you know, I was fresh. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing, but I, again, I, you know, the CEO saw some twinkle in my eye or something. And we just, you know, he, he gave me more opportunity than I deserved. Um, but I saw what a good culture does. I saw what, um, you know, rapid growth does to a company. I saw mm -hmm. what um, the concessions that, that sometimes are made around culture in favor of growth. Um, I saw what unlimited investment uh, in, a, in an incredible hot market does in terms of, um, you know, this was the era of of uh, hundreds of Aeron chairs and beer in the office and, you know, bar stools and, you know, pool tables and foosball. You know, it was, it was that, what that was, it was when that was really first becoming part of company culture in the workplace. Mm. Like, Hey, like work is fun. So stay at work longer kind of idea. Yeah. Um, so um, I learned a lot about, about that because I was very close to it. It was a scale of business that wasn't hard to see, right? It wasn't a 1,000, 2,000 person company. I could see everyone from top to bottom who was working there and I could see the stresses and the opportunities there. So I learned a lot about that. I went to school. When I left school, I just kind of, um, I was, the first job I ever had was with a a, a person called Kyle Cooper. He was pretty famous at the time in LA because he had done the seven film titles, you know, with Brad Pitt. And wow. um, he was kind of like this famous film title at the time director. And um, he saw my work in a grad show. He said, you want to come work for me? And I said, okay. I didn't work there very long because it was very difficult um, and exhausting and frankly scary to work for him. 
um, yeah. even though he was really talented. Um, so I didn't love that, but um, I learned a lot very quickly. Um, but then I just, I kind of kept taking new opportunities and I freelanced between LA, San Francisco, Chicago, and New York, um, just going to different agencies and studios and working on different types of digital and um, film projects. And that, for me, I did that for six or seven years. It was just, um, it was a way to look into workplaces, mm -hmm. a way to see what resonated with me. Um, it was a sort of voyeuristic kind of experience, right? Where you could kind mm -hmm. of see how different companies, maybe even working in the same space, approach things incredibly differently or how their culture or leadership affected the way uh, their outcomes were even if they were working on the same kind of of work um so that was super super um revealing um i made my way to new york at that time and i met my business partner at a company called brand new school still around still very successful design company um and we again like i said we were put on projects that we shouldn't have been on, you know, we somehow got to be <laughs> leaders of these projects. We flew to Argentina. We were directing commercials with 300, 400 people. We were doing all this direct to client work that was really uh, taught us a lot. And um, we kind of learned on the job without it being our own capital at risk. So we learned that we worked well together and we're very collaborative and, and just uh, set the stage. And, and over a, a banh mi sandwich in the Lower East Side, we said, hey, you know, we should start a company. Yeah, let's do it. You know, mm -hmm. the, the naivety of starting a business, right? But we both, um, we both were kind of entrepreneurial. We were both at the point where we were just like, I think that at the time, the, the owner of Brand New School, which was probably a 100-person company at the time, um, was probably only a few years older than we were four mm -hmm. or five years so you know so from from our standpoint we were like well we can either start building our own brand uh with our own sweat and our own money or you know work for someone else and mm -hmm. there's nowhere to go so we did it um and that was very naive and it was kind of slow roll for a long time and we were small and and uh but it's always been just like very methodical growth and very strategic growth and and mm -hmm. just trying to do right do right by what we want to do and what we want to put into the world. Fantastic. And the rest is history. Kind of, or history is still in progress. We still Absolutely. have a lot to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And talking uh, again about the experience design that you mentioned earlier. So how do you apply that to the workplace today? What are the, what are the steps that you go through? To the workplace of our clients or our own workplace? Let's start with your clients. Great. Um, so, Workplace experience design is a growing piece of our business, uh, probably not prime, maybe it's a substantive piece of our business. Mm -hmm. So we, we um, I, I think we're experts in a certain part of it, but we're also, you know, newbies in, a, in another way. So I want to be clear about that. I think we're looking at it from a new lens, which might be really valuable. I think um, sometimes those new lenses help everyone unlock some of the same problems that have that have been there for the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I mean, our firm really leans into experience design in the workplace through the lens of non-commodity experiences. And let me define that. There's a lot, if, let's talk about pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. In the workplace, there's a lot in the workplace that we have nothing to do with, but it's fundamental to what makes employees um, happy and efficient. Um, if you were to imagine a rectangle in your head right now, uh, this is the this is an abstract idea of what an organization invests in its workplace um, in terms of money and space. Mm -hmm. Of that rectangle, we probably only really are hired to think about a reasonably small percentage of that, maybe less than 20%. The rest of it is quite functional. It's programming around workspaces and desks and conference rooms and um, food and beverage and wellness spaces and, um, you know, breakout spaces. And, uh, uh, you know, th these are fundamental parts of any workplace program. And mm -hmm. most of those things are handled by architects, as, as they likely should be. 
Um, the, the remaining 10 or 20% that we really lean into is, I would say, the things that help people collaborate, commune, play, interact, learn, um, participate, create together. That's the stuff that we like to design uh, within the workplace. Mm. And it's it's qualitative in value, but it can be highly, highly valuable. So, so some examples might be, um, we've done experience centers in the workplace where both employees and partners come to learn more about the culture or, or information or best practices or vision of the company. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done interactive spaces that allow people to participate in their own culture, right? Suggest things, get feedback, um, understand their coworkers in other locations, communicate in weird new ways. Um, So we've also done large, um, large gestures in, you know, big commercial workspace lobbies that sort of set the tone um, for a company of who they are and what they're intending to be so that anyone who walks in, existing employees, their guests, partners, media, recruits is a big one for HR, Mm -hmm. you know, feels instantly as if this company is the place for me. You know, and we work a lot with big tech, uh, the Ubers, the Facebooks, the Googles, the LinkedIn's of the world. Mm -hmm. And we often are helping them bring that sentiment of what it means to work at an innovative sort of visionary technology company to life in ways that feel a little bit more human and a little less digital, Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that creating spaces for collaboration and play and so on. Um, they're very important to building the, the company's culture, your, your, your client's culture. But obviously, uh, in our current situation, these spaces are under the spotlight at the moment. And um, this kind of in-person collaboration that, that we thrive on isn't happening in the same way it was before. So I'm interested in, in how you can design workplaces um, in a well, in a post-COVID world, we're not there yet. We're still we're still <laughs> during COVID. <Yes. laughs> so how how has that changed what you do? Well, I mean, you know, I think um, as with any huge challenge comes some amazing opportunity, and I actually think the last several months have shown that we're like incredibly well positioned to rethink the way workplaces are designed in ways that aren't incremental, um, Mm -hmm. but rather really, really different. Like, uh, you know, I want to, I want to go there. I think the, the, the expectation now of, of, of our world and, and modern workers is, is incredibly different. And I think the, the risk at hand right now is that, that companies will take incremental steps to address COVID Mm-hmm. but not revolutionary steps. And what a waste of a mm. pivotal moment. What a waste of the potential to really change the way we will work in the future and what the workplace becomes. I mean, if this is a 10% shift, if all we're doing is making six foot radii around people and changing circulation flows and uh, 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 changing the density of workers, but we're, we're keeping the same program. It's just like these tweaks to program and we're putting hand sanitizer and stickers on mm. the wall. If yeah. that's what comes out of this, we really lost. Yeah. Um, one of our clients, a big bank in, um, uh, based in, 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 uh, in London, you know, has said, this is a myth busting moment the myths around work that have been created for decades Mm -hmm. are finally, are finally coming to to an end because Mm -hmm. the myths are busted because productivity is often higher and happiness is often higher. And that's the data. Mm -hmm. So if that's the data, all the, the assumptions we made about gathering people and what they had to do and the expectations for time in time out and the the functions they had there 
it, it's all gone. So if, if the myth is busted, we have to rebrief our entire team and start from scratch. And I think what I'm hoping to, to do is, is very specific. Mm -hmm. um, let me go back to my rectangle analogy. Um, if that rectangle was a pre-COVID rectangle, that's the space you know a company would have invested for its employees pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm seeing a lot is is clients saying, "Oh well, we used to have a hundred X in there, but now we're going to have thirty percent less. So we have seventy X in there, but seventy X needs to be spread out to be safe. So we're going to spread that seventy X back out into that rectangle. So now it's just a less dense grid of things." Mm -hmm. That's basically 95% of what you hear and see as action plans from architects and workplace design teams around the world. Um, how sad is that? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> what really needs to happen is not just a, a shift in that way, but asking ourselves what the purpose of the workplace is now. Um, I still believe that workplace and the architecture of of companies the architecture of organizations like how they manifest their company in physicalized form is one of the most substantive ways a company can express itself to the world i think it has a gravitas uh and a sort of a a, 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 a totality that goes far beyond just a brand or just a digital platform. Mm -hmm. And even companies like a Facebook, you know, lean so much into their campus and campus design as a way of, 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 um, of, of, of giving, giving reality to the digital vision, if you will. Mm -hmm. So culture is probably my biggest, um, you know, I, I ring the culture bell of of workplace all the time and i think that this shift with covid has demonstrated that um, we can do so much of the functional things we were once doing at work uh not at work whether it's at home or in you know quote unquote third places mm -hmm. um that's that's fine um but we cannot replace culture in those home or third places yeah and so the the thesis i have and i think it's worth asking the audience is, you know, if culture is the North Star of the workplace, then how does that change the program and experience design of the workplace? And I mm -hmm. would argue that in that this imaginary rectangle we keep referencing, mm -hmm. um, the bulk of that rectangle, at least 50% of it should now become dedicated to experiences that you literally cannot do at home or in third mm -hmm. places because they require a people coming together safely of course mm -hmm. and interacting with ideas and tools and information and content and objects and spaces that are like no other that that couldn't happen because they need to be financed by a large organization with the scale and power to make these spaces and mm -hmm. much like you know, you can you can um, you can go online and ride a digital roller coaster, but going to a theme park with a roller coaster is pretty unique. And and yeah. you and I cannot recreate the roller coaster in our homes or in third places. <laughs> it's the same thing. So, yeah. so that's what I envision. I envision uh, you know uh, workplaces where going to work is not an everyday thing. It's certainly mm -hmm. a hybrid thing. And when you go to work is very highly tuned to the program set by the organization. Um, and it happens in these ritualistic beats. Um, imagine where your teams are working distributed and you're super efficient, but you have weekly or biweekly or monthly all hands where your teams come and they use the space to do innovation sprints. Mm -hmm. Or there's an education program for three days and then they come back and the next week they do everyone on campus working in these spaces with these tools and experiences to manifest innovative ideas and do quick prototyping and R&D. And then they go back to their work from home or they go back to third places where they then use all the beautiful tools and Zooms and, uh, and, and workplace and Microsoft Teams and all these things to actually execute and operationalize the things they came up with together in the mm -hmm. workplace because that's where real collaboration inspiration happens. Mm. So why don't we do why don't we do that? 
Why don't we do that? And then, and you can think about how HR uses these things. Recruiting is one of the biggest uh, drivers of design that I've seen in the last five years as all these companies compete over the same talent. Mm -hmm. You know, campuses should become like temples to recruitment, you know, amazing places where uh, they use the space to get people invested and deeper insight into what the company is about and the potential. Um, that's what space should be used for, you know? Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm waxing poetic, but. No, that's, but um, that's, that's a really like, interesting potential future scenario where th these, these offices, you know, they're all over the world, uh, thousands of office locations. And rather than just letting them sit virtually empty, they could become collaboration hubs um, and so long as we're in this situation where people are required to work remotely, work from home or, or, or work in mm -hmm. these different places, um, keeping a, a central office is effectively like keeping the culture intact, isn't it? And it's where you bring yes. your people to remind them of the brand and the culture and to sort of reignite those creative juices that for people who are sat, stuck at home in isolation, it's, it's difficult to, to get creative, isn't it? <laughs> You know, and, uh, and and you're a creative firm, so yeah. uh, and you must feel this too. It, it's difficult to innovate and think creatively when we're, you know, um, stuck at home and, and we can't collaborate with with other people. Exactly. But mm. if I know that at a certain cadence and for various reasons, not one time or one off, but I have a schedule of moments mm. that allow me to quote unquote come back to the hive, or. Um, or come back together, and I know those are coming. I would argue that I would, you know, psychologically, I'm going to enjoy the efficiencies and flexibility I have while I'm working from home to do the endeavors that are optimized there. Mm -hmm. And my my desire and stress about working from home, my desire to go back to the office and work with people, and my stress from working at home in the sort of isolation is will be mediated because I know it's coming. It's part of the program. Mm -hmm. It's part of how I work and how the future of, of work strategy goes. So, you know, I actually think it'll have emotional benefits on both sides, right? Mm. Lean, lean into the scenarios when working from home and being efficient in those ways, the yeah. doing, if you will, like the, mm -hmm. the doing and the operationalizing, the execution, uh, very efficient things that require efficient digital tools of which there are thousands. So we're covered. Mm -hmm. And then the abstract things that are less about doing, but about asking and opening questions and, and, and meandering and exploring that mm -hmm. are best done interpersonally mm -hmm. and with the physical space and temporal space to be able to do that. But, uh, let's design the spaces to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I love what you said then about coming back to the hive. It, it really is yeah. a hive, isn't it? It's a yeah. hive. I love that. Yeah. It's a hive, right? The hive is where Queen Bee controls the rhythms and uh, directs yeah. what should happen with its, uh, with all the other bees. I think it's not yeah. a bad metaphor. Absolutely. No, oh, I love that. And um, I know we're, uh, we're sort of reaching the end of our episode, but there was one thing I wanted to ask you about that we haven't touched on yet. And that's about the use of data. Yeah. Um, and I know that you, as part of the experiences that you create, you often incorporate the use of data and it's such a big, big part of our world now. Um, so how do you, how are you using data and why do you think it can be valuable in experience design? So that's a great question. Um, so data, we've used a lot of data in interesting ways, not scary ways, like interesting, creative, uh, inspiring ways. So, you know, data has a, a, there's a Pavlovian response to saying data, and I want your audience to 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 know. Um, <laughs> you know, data does have a dark side, and and I think we've we've spent some time talking and thinking about that. But there is also, it, in a way, in modern design, mm -hmm. uh, in all all senses, it's also an asset. It's also a tool in your toolbox, a paintbrush in your you know kit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it's not that we need and require data. It's just that through virtually every modern large company thinks about data intrinsically as part of what it is and what it does. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, exponential for, for companies in banking or 
or big tech, right? Where data is the is is sort of the only way the company runs. It's how it gets its efficiencies of scale. It's how it gets its knowledge. It's how it makes uh, innovation happen. Um, so to think about that being true for those kinds of organizations and not bringing that to the surface somehow in experience design or in the workplace um, seems like a missing opportunity and seems like if you're going to talk about the culture of a company or where it's headed, to not use that tool would be strange. So here's how we might use it with some examples. Um, for LinkedIn, uh, last year we did a project in which um, in one of their main buildings uh, in their campus in California, you know, we leveraged all the data of their insights platform to help visualize for everyone, all their employees, as well as their guests and partners, um, trends in the global workforce, which effectively shows people how the work they're doing is manifesting in creating more equality between demand and supply of global workers. Where mm -hmm. is knowledge going? Where are skills going? Um, you know, how are these industries changing? How can one industry actually be more correlated to another industry um, uh, in ways that only big data could tell you? So we, we allowed employees to participate in that, learn in that and see it at a grand scale, because ultimately their work on the LinkedIn platform every day is in service of this knowledge. OK, mm -hmm. a second yeah. example. Um, is a work we did for an, an amazing biotech company called United Therapeutics um, in Silver Spring, Maryland. I think the largest employer in that in that city. Um, amazing uh, company, forward-thinking CEO Martin Rothblatt. You should watch your TED talk. Um, they built a new uh, headquarters building on their campus, and it happened to be a completely site net zero building, meaning it it produced as much energy as it used on site, which is a really a feat of engineering, especially in the East Coast of the United States where climate swings rapidly mm -hmm. around the seasons. Um, so why do people work for United Therapeutics? Because it's an incredibly innovative company. It saves lives with its biotech innovation, but if it's gonna do anything, it's gonna do it, You know, if they're gonna build a building, it's gonna be the most incredibly engineered building ever. If they're gonna build a car, it's gonna be the same. So Martine wanted to show her employees and potential employees this new tenacious vision they had about, you know, helping the world and, and building something that doesn't use any energy um, mm -hmm. than it doesn't produce. So how do we do that? We employed experience design based on the data of the building to share back to all employees what the building's doing at any given time. And every employee knows if the building's making energy or using energy, and they can tune subtly their own behaviors in the workplace to help that building achieve its mission every day. Wow. So you think about that, it's not an education platform, although it is, it's not a big brother yelling at people when they're using, when they flip the lights on, it's a beautiful integrated set of experiences in the building mm -hmm. that is intimately tied to the data of the building. Mm -hmm. So tied into the data systems and energy systems of the building. So that's a perfect example where data becomes part of the message of what the company is all about. Yeah. Um, and I could give you more examples, but but those are the kinds of things we think about. Um, and um, And in that way, data is performing just like any other kind of cultural or organizational input. Um, and, uh, and it's just something we're pretty good at bringing to life. Yeah, absolutely. And data is such a big part of our world now. And, it, and it's going to continue to be that way, isn't it? Um, as we step towards the future of work. Um, and that does bring me nicely onto my last question. Um, cool. the, the, this is the, the future of work podcast. So of course, we're, we're really interested in in what you think might be coming around the corner um, in terms of the workplace um, and design and the experience. Um, so I'm just interested to know if you have any other thoughts that you want to add um, about the future of work and how Hush is um, is gearing up for that. Yeah, I mean, I think I would, I'll, I'll, I'll double back on, on, on sort of what I 
uh, I mentioned, I think uh, like our kind of core vision and thesis is, is really mm-hmm. like, um, can we reclaim the workplace as an experience center mm-hmm. um, and divest the workplace of work? Okay. You know? Yeah. It's kind of what uh, I think is is our whole our whole flip that we'd like to see. And even if we get halfway there or a quarter of the way there, I think it'll be a refreshing way to set up the next era of what it means to be an employee. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know we've we've spent the last call it a decade and a half, two decades, um, being uh, 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 cajoled into uh, coming to work because of amenities and free food and um and a nice chair and uh, beautiful materials um and that's that's cool i get it i'm a designer by trade i i fetishize architecture and things and spaces like anyone else in our Mm -hmm. field but i believe we are ripe for a new era where bells and whistles aren't the thing Mm -hmm. and um we're not forced to be there. We are there to really do things like never before and impossible to do elsewhere. And um, that's a pretty cool vision, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you so much, David, for joining us today. I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, and can you finish by telling us how our listeners can find out more about Hush and, and the work that you do? Absolutely. Um, you can go to our website, which is Hey hush.com so h-e-y like hey hello hey hush.com and uh, our instagram account is official hush studios uh, and we publish a bunch of content on linkedin and other posts so thought leaderships on linkedin a website for uh for hiring and open roles and cool portfolio stuff and instagram for work in progress cool creative tests visualizations and uh, other ideas Brilliant. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, David. And we look forward to having you back on the podcast again someday. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. I appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you. Take care. If it's impacting the future of work, it's in the Future of Work podcast by allwork.space. Are you ready?